a call came in on a blustery November afternoon, November 17th, 1954. Jeanette Ernest, a bright-eyed 11-year-old, had vanished from a Fort Worth washeteria while waiting for her mother to pick her up after school. Nadine Ernest arrived to find her daughter gone, and a chill ran down her spine. She knew with a mother's intuition who had taken Jeanette, and it was a man I'd come to know all too well in the coming days. Thurman Priest, Nadine's brother-in-law. Me? My name's not important. I'm a private eye. I'd been working alongside the police in homicide for over a decade, and cases involving children always hit me the hardest. There's something about the innocence lost, the futures stolen, that never quite leaves you. And as I listened to Nadine recount her suspicions about Priest, I felt that familiar knot form in my gut. Priest, a 48-year-old bookkeeper, had developed an unhealthy fixation on young Jeanette. He'd started attending her Sunday school classes, much to the discomfort of the minister and Nadine herself. She'd even gone so far as to change their place of worship, hoping to put some distance between her daughter and the man who seemed to be growing more obsessed by the day. But Priest was undeterred. He began coming over to the earnest home, playing with Jeanette and her siblings under the guise of a doting uncle. Nadine saw through the charade and warned him off, but it seemed her words had fallen on deaf ears. Now, with Jeanette missing and Priest nowhere to be found, I knew we were in a race against time. We hit the ground running, canvassing the area and putting out an APB on Priest's vehicle. The hours ticked by with no sign of either of them and the knot in my stomach grew tighter. As we dug deeper, a disturbing picture began to emerge. Witnesses at a motel in Irving, Texas, remembered seeing Priest and a young girl staying for just an hour before moving on. At the Holiday Motel in Baxter Springs, Kansas, the manager recounted a chilling scene. Jeanette running from their cabin in obvious distress, only to be grabbed by a priest and shoved back into the car. Bloodstains in the bathroom told a story I wasn't sure I wanted to hear. The trail went cold for a while, until a tip came in from a motel manager in Mount Vernon, Missouri. Priest had stopped there and called his wife, Etta May. The manager overheard Etta May ask about a little girl and when told Priest was alone, she urged the manager to call the police. It was the break we'd been hoping for. We had Priest in custody within the hour, but Jeanette was still missing. In the interrogation room, he claimed ignorance at first, feigning confusion about the girl's whereabouts. But when it was my turn in the interrogation room across the table from him, I mentioned how beautiful she was, and something shifted in Priest's demeanor. A dreamy look came over his face as he agreed, as if lost in some sick fantasy. He agreed to lead us to Jeanette, and I felt a flicker of hope that maybe, just maybe, we'd find her alive. But as we followed, Priest's directions to a dense oak grove off Highway 66, that hope began to fade. And when we found her, lying there among the fallen leaves, I felt a part of myself break. She'd been shot once in the temple with a 32 automatic, her body left exposed to the elements. Priest claimed it was love, that he and Jeanette had a special bond. But I knew better. This was the act of a predator, a man who couldn't bear to let go of his twisted obsession, even if it meant snuffing out a young life. The case took a toll on all of us. Jeanette's classmates, who'd prayed for her safe return, were left to grapple with a loss too heavy for their young shoulders. Her father, bedridden with grief, could barely function. 
and Nadine, stoic in her public appearances, channeled her pain into a fierce determination to see justice served. In the end, Priest was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. It was a victory, but a hollow one. No amount of punishment could bring Jeanette back or erase the trauma inflicted on her family. And as I watched Priest being led away in cuffs, I couldn't help but wonder how many other predators were out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for their moment to strike. The Jeanette Ernest case stayed with me long after the verdict was read. It was a stark reminder of the evil that men were capable of and the innocence that could be shattered in an instant. I'd like to think that Jeanette found peace in the end, that she knew how hard we fought for her. But the truth is, there is no happy ending to a story like this. Only a void, a space where a bright young life once was, and the lingering question of how we keep our children safe in a world that can be so cruel. As I sit here now, years later, the details of the case are still etched in my memory. The sight of Jeanette's body in that grove. The look on Priest's face as he described his love for her. The anguish in Nadine's eyes as she fought for justice. They're the things that keep me up at night. The ghosts that haunt my waking hours. But they're also the things that keep me going. That remind me why I do this job. Because for every Thurman priest in the world, there's a Jeanette Ernest who deserves to be fought for, to have her story told. And as long as I have breath in my body, I'll keep fighting for them, keep shining a light into the darkness, keep hoping that someday we'll find a way to make the world a little safer, a little kinder for the Jeanettes of the world. And that closes the book on the case of the obsessed uncle.